Well, hey, good morning and welcome to Fusion at Home. It is so awesome to get to be with you here this morning. You know, there are people walking in the foyer. There are people uh, walking in, they're grabbing their cup of coffee. And, you know, that can be difficult for you to do online, right? You can't walk into our foyer. You can't get a cup of coffee from uh, one of our hospitality members here today. But you do have an opportunity where you can connect with people. And there's a couple ways in which you can do that. One is the chat on the live stream on the app, um, which is a great thing that you can just pull up on your phone and kind of chat and say, hey, I'm here. This is where I'm from. You know, whatever you feel comfortable doing, just even a simple good morning. Uh, you can also do that on Facebook. If you're watching with us on Facebook, um, there's also a place there that you can comment or chat there today just to just to create some sort of community, just so you're not um, just watching like a Netflix show, right? Like where you're sitting back you're relaxing on your um, on your couch. Uh, you you can do that while you're worshiping, but uh, that you know when we worship, it's it's intended to be corporate, um, and that's a way once you can do that. The other thing you can do is check in on our app, and uh, you know just letting us know that you're here. And specifically, I want to point the attention to the uh, the prayer request part of that because that is a great place for you to kind of share with us what's going on you know, share some something that's happening great in your life or something that you're really struggling with. Maybe there's a health concern with somebody you know or yourself, um, or you're just struggling um, in any way. You can share that with us. Uh, we would love to just have the opportunity to praise, you know, say a quick praise to God for, for what, what's happening in your life or, and, uh, you know, sh uh, you know, pray for you here at Fusion. So uh, there's that. If you're a first time guest though, we want you to check in on that app like everybody else, but there's a box that you can check that says, I'm new. And uh, that's just a great thing for you to check and let me know that you're new. I have a gift that I would love to send you via email this week, but I can't do that if you don't check that box. That box kind of sends me a message and says, hey, Corey, uh, this person is new. But hey, you know, as we jump into worship, I just want to remind you, uh, you know, it you being online is is very cool and unique um, because you can share with people that you're online. Uh, and there's a couple ways in which you can do that. You, If you're watching on Facebook, you can hit that share button that uh, uh, that's right there and just share it on your public feed that says, you know, you could not type anything or you could say, hey, join me today while I'm watching Fusion or uh, join me for worship today. Uh, you can also do that through the app. There's a share button on the app. Uh, on the right hand, up, up on the right hand corner, uh, there's a button that looks like a, a native share button. And you can, you know, you can email the stream, you can text the stream, you can let people know that you're there. But, you know, I, I see people throughout the store and I don't know who they are, but they come up to me and talk to me and they're like, oh yeah, so-and-so shared your feed and, uh, or shared your live stream. And I, it really touched me, you know, it really helped me in a time of difficulty. So you don't know what friends of yours um, that you have that may, 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 you may not even know they're struggling, but you sharing that feed um, may, may give them uh, uh, an ounce of hope today. So I just encourage you to do that. Well, hey, let's jump into worship, and I'm just excited to see what God has for us here today.
morning, Fusion. As we roll into, um, into worship this morning, I just wanted to say I hope you all had a beautiful and happy Thanksgiving. Um, you can have a seat. We're just going to um, start the morning off with some scripture um, from the book of Isaiah. Even the wilderness and the desert will be glad in those days. The wasteland will rejoice and blossom with spring crocuses. Yes, there will be an abundance of flowers and singing and joy. The desert will become as green as the mountains of Lebanon, as lovely as Mount Carmel or the plain of Sharon. There the Lord will display his glory, the splendor of our God. With this news, strengthen those who have tired hands and encourage those who have weak knees. Say to those with feel, fearful hearts, be strong and do not fear, for your God is coming to destroy your enemies. He is coming to save you. And when he comes, he will open the eyes of the blind and unplug the ears of the deaf. The lame will leap like deer and those who cannot speak will sing for joy. Springs will gush forth in the wilderness and streams will water the wasteland. The parched ground will become a pool and springs of water will satisfy the thirsty land. Marsh grass and reeds and rushes will flourish where desert jackals once lived and a great road will go through that once deserted land. It will be named the highway of holiness. Evil-minded people will never travel on it. It will only be for those who walk in God's ways. Fools will never walk there. Lions will not lurk along its course, nor any other ferocious beasts. There will be no other dangers. Only the redeemed will walk on it. Those who have been ransomed by the Lord will return. They that enter Jerusalem singing, crowned with everlasting joy. Sorrow and mourning will disappear, and they will be filled with joy and gladness. Amen. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me all my days. I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God So good with every breath. 
heads to close our eyes this morning together and, and just sit at the feet of our dad as his children. Father God, of all weeks of the year, this is a weekend where we come before you incredibly thankful. Thankful for the place we hold in your kingdom, that of children who have been adopted back into the arms of a loving father. A father who sacrificed himself to make this redemption possible. And we don't look past that this morning, Lord. May that be that the number one thing on the list of things we're thankful for. That we have hope, that we have peace. That we're counted as righteous for our father because of the righteousness of his son, our savior. We come before you today also, Lord, grateful that, that as millions and millions have, have prayed, seeking the mercy of Jesus and your spirit to move, we thank you that, that hostages in the Middle East have been released. Lord, those are answers to prayer. People who were innocent, who were caught up in the middle of a conflict, and God, just pray that, that that continues to take place, that your spirit is at work even in sometimes, God, we look at circumstances and we don't know what you're doing or why you're allowing what you're allowing. When we see the innocent suffer, we're, we're even more perplexed. And yet when we see these kinds of results, it's that reminder of how desperate we are for you, God, that we, we can't accomplish anything without you. I pray for those in this room. I pray for those of joining us online right now, God, knowing that, that there's burdens that we are collectively carrying individual families, relationships, on behalf of kids and grandkids and moms and dads and aunts and uncles and God, people in our family that maybe even this weekend that we got to see and, and it was good, but maybe there's also, God, the reminder of the, the conflict, the struggle, the battle that's waging. And we just need your spirit to give us strength to endure, to trust you in the midst of circumstances that that would be so easy for us to just drift away. May we hold firm with perseverance the faith we profess that you are sovereign, you are in control, and you do have a plan, God. It doesn't orient around our timetable, but it's your kingdom, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. We just ask you, God, to help us, help our trust in you to increase when things aren't happening according to how we'd like to see them happen. As we open up your word today, we ask that your spirit would, uh, would stretch and challenge each and every one of us. That we would step back to a moment in history that we're familiar with. We might see it in a new way. And it might push us out of our comfort zone just a little bit more in our boldness to live out our faith. No matter who's watching, no matter what environment we're in. Recognizing that there are so many opportunities before us every day to make an impact in the life of another person. We ask this in your mighty and holy name. And all God's people said, amen. Well, you can have a seat. I want to welcome you to Fusion this morning and um, those that are, that are joining us here on Thanksgiving morning. Maybe some of you are here with family members from out of town and, and you're excited to be in the same room together worshiping. It's great to have you. For those of you that maybe are out visiting family members and you're joining us on the live stream, uh, we can feel your presence with us, right? Let's just pretend like we can, yeah, we can feel, no, we know you're there. We know the live stream is happening, and we want you to know that, that what's going on there, the Holy Spirit's just as real and relevant where you are as, as he is where, where we are. We can't see if you brushed your teeth or got dressed today, um, but that's okay. We're glad that you're joining us. Um, some of the people here, I can tell, didn't shower either, so you're in good company. Um, 
But hey, I want to mention, as you came in the room today, uh, you were given a worship guide, and in there was a communication card that's also available online on our app, and we ask every family every week to fill out that communication card. Let us know you're here for worship. It's a great opportunity to communicate various things in your life uh, every week. Uh, Prayer requests come in through that online check-in and through those communication cards that are then sent out to a team of about 50 people that are praying over those things, those names, individual needs. Uh, And also at the end of our worship gathering, every Sunday, there's a group of people over here to the side ready to pray with anybody that would need it. And you can always online share prayer through the app, uh, share prayer requests that way as well. We want to be there for each other, to pray for each other, to support one another uh, in whatever way that looks like, whether you're maybe new to the family or you've been a part of the family for a very, very long time. If you are a guest with us today, we do have something special we we have for you. Uh, I'll just kind of tease you that we'll share about that at the end of our time together. Um, So you could kind of hold out for that, but we want to specially honor you and and say and consider you as a gift from God to us this morning, both those who might be guests here in the room as well as those who are guests online. Okay, uh, let's transition into the message. Well, that week was the most important week of the entire year. It was the week that everybody was looking forward to. And when it finally came every day, all day, sun up to sundown, the city was hustling and bustling with people. Everywhere you went, it was shoulder to shoulder. Everywhere you turned, there were crowds. Everywhere, lines for everything. And and if you didn't have what you needed, the city would probably run out before the week was up. It wasn't Christmas. Uh, it wasn't Black Friday. Um, but Thursday of that week, for the first time, if you were to go out that evening, the streets were dead. It was empty. Nobody was out and about. Everybody was at home or, or in their homemade tent outside the city for the evening where they were camping. This one moment happened every year. It was the most important and valuable national holiday on their calendar. If you were one of the Hebrew people, you dreamed of at least once in your lifetime being able to make the journey to Jerusalem so that just once you could be there to celebrate Passover. There were some that would be traveling on foot and it would take them a week or more to arrive. They would set up camp outside the city and they didn't have these little things in a bag that you could just throw out and boom, they popped up. They'd bring lumber and they'd bring palm branches to build a makeshift shack on the outskirts of Jerusalem, and that would be their home for the week. Others would be from nearby, a few towns over. It might take them a few hours or a couple of days in order to get to Jerusalem, and maybe they were able to rent a room for a few nights. Others would be local, and they would be preparing for this this heavy influx of people coming into Jerusalem. And even though all the residences look different, even though all the rooms Looked different. The ambiance was different in different places. The scale was different based on each family's context. The table they sat around for the feast was the same. Even though dishes and cups and bowls and the colors in the rooms were different, the menu was the same. The script that guided them through the Passover meal was identical for the last 1,500 years. The elements that they tasted and touched and smelled that symbolically spoke about their relationship with their God 
Absolutely nothing from that tradition for a millennia and a half. Nothing had been added to it and nothing had been taken away from it. It was the Passover celebration. A night that, that wasn't just about the meal. Wasn't just about what you did. Wasn't just about this ancient ritual. The Passover celebration was about your identity as the Hebrew people. It was the reminder of who you are. The reminder of who God is. A reminder that he has a plan and a provision for you, for your life. That you're valuable to him. And that your people were specifically chosen to be his children. Passover was a night to remember the origins of their people. The beginnings of their nation. It was uh, the story of God's generosity to rescue your ancestors from slavery in Egypt for four centuries, 1,500 years ago. Where God would put his power on display through Moses. Nine times there would be miracles demonstrating the power of Jehovah over the power of Pharaoh. But it would take that tenth miracle, that tenth plague, to finally persuade Pharaoh to let Moses' people go. So God, through Moses, prepares his people for the tenth miracle where the life of the firstborn of every household will be taken as a consequence of rebellion against the one true God. It's the night the Spirit of God will pass over the empire of Egypt and many firstborns will die. But those who obey the Lord will live. For the children of God, the Hebrews, they're given a specific ceremony, a ritual to perform that is to be a symbol to God of their trust and faith in Him. Their salvation will be secured by the slaughtering of an innocent lamb and that blood being painted across the wooden posts on their door. And the Spirit of God, that would be a sign of the Spirit of God of their obedience and their faith. And the Spirit would pass over every home that was demonstrating that. And after that first Passover, the memory of God, what God did will live long in the minds of the Hebrew people. Moses even writes a message from the Lord. He says, This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for on this very day I brought your hosts out of the land of Egypt. For 1,500 years this ritual has been repeated every year. And for those who are Jewish, the night God demonstrated that he held more power over the most powerful uh, uh, empire the world had ever seen, Egypt, God rescued his children 1,500 years before Jesus arrived. And ever since then, every year at Passover, that Thursday night, a part of that Passover ritual around the table is to look forward to the day when God shows up and rescues his people again. To look forward to the day asking God to send the Messiah who would come to save them once and for all. The bondage now at the time of Jesus, it isn't quite as extreme as when they were slaves in Egypt 1,500 years before. But in the last thousand years, empires have risen and fallen and risen and fallen over and over and over again. And the prior victors who fall hand over the lowly Jews as a pittance to the new conquering king. From the Babylonians to the Persians to the Greeks to the Syrians and now the Romans. There's been a millennium of your people's story where you've just been owned and traded and owned and traded away like a piece of property. And you are desperate for the arrival of the promised one, the Messiah, the one that you believe will overthrow the traditional houses of power and usher in a new kingdom. That's what you're waiting for. That's what you're hoping for. That's what God has promised. That's why you want to go to Jerusalem for Passover. It's what you're dreaming might be a reality now through this rabbi carpenter from Nazareth named Jesus. For 1,500 years, the whole nation of Israel, on the night of Passover, they're asking God to send their rescuer from heaven. And what most most don't realize is he's here. Well, today we're going to bring this series, Dinner with Jesus, to a close. Kind of. Kind of. Over the last nine weeks, we've examined how much ministry did Jesus did around mealtime, and we've barely scratched the surface. We could keep going, but starting after Christmas at the dawn of 2024, we're going to kind of continue to talk about what are the implications of this model of ministry that Jesus employed that, that's centered around hospitality. Um, I'm going to have Dan go ahead and bring the house lights up, season, uh, scene three, because people are already starting to doze. There we go. There we go. Good. <laughs> 
So Jesus employed this tool for ministry around the dinner table. And at the heart of it was hospitality. It was inviting everybody to the table. Anybody was welcome. Nobody was restricted. And that's what was so countercultural at that time. Now here we are 2,000 years later, and, and, and even though our tables are not nearly as exclusive or segregated as the, the culture at the time of Jesus, the table is still an incredible entry point for people into relationship. Because whenever we're going to get together with somebody, normally there's a meal involved. Hey, you want to get together? Great. What do you want to do? Well, we're going to eat. Do we eat in or do we go out? And there might be some other activity, but how many of us, honestly, it's just like, I don't need another activity. Going out to eat or getting together to eat, that's good enough, right? That's enough reason to get together with people. So, so the table is still a central focus of bonding. It's an environment where we connect with other human beings. And we're going to continue to consider throughout 2024, what are the implications of this tool that Jesus utilized as a means with which the world changed. Because when you really look at the the next couple hundred years after Jesus' resurrection and the birth of the church, the Roman Empire is toppled by Christianity. And it's not toppled from the top down, but the Roman Empire is flipped upside down from the grassroots. Why? Because everybody was welcome in the church. Everybody was invited. Nobody was restricted. And that was empowering And there was a warmth and a comfort that came when you knew that everybody that came through the doors, that you were excited to have them here. And I think in our culture today, the same is true. There are people longing to belong. They're crying out for a place to fit. And and there's nowhere better to fit than in the church of Jesus discovering who God has called us to be. So after Jesus lays down his life, after he rises again, after he ascends to heaven, it's then that God sends his Holy Spirit to the earth to dwell inside the heart of every Christ follower, and the church is born. The church is very simply the family of God. Now, how do you describe a family? Well, we typically describe a family when we introduce somebody, hey, this is my brother, this is my sister, this is my cousin, this is my nephew, this, these are my grandkids, right? We, we identify our family based on how we're related to them. And God has a family too. We just sang about it. It's a family that is ever expanding through adoption. God as a good father is engaging the hearts of orphans around the world today. Maybe in this room, online, right now, God is engaging the hearts of people who feel like orphans, who don't know who God is, who don't know if there's a creator that cares about them. And that curiosity is God drawing you to himself. He's drawing lost children to find their home with him where he can care for you and nurture you. Now the church is that family of brothers and sisters and that's true of the local context that we're in here for Fusion Community Church but but the church is also bigger than that. It's global. It stretches around the world. Different cultures, languages, time periods. And yet all of us are unified around this wonderful, glorious heavenly Father who sets the table of grace and invites all of us through his sacrifice, where we can find a seat at the table. And that's something we should be incredibly grateful for, something that hopefully is at the top of the list you shared this last Thursday or whenever you met and sat down for Thanksgiving and and maybe went around the table sharing what you're thankful for. Hopefully, your place with God is at the top of that list. Now, at Thanksgiving holiday in our culture, the central focus oftentimes is, is the food, right? I mean, the food is often the center focus of Thanksgiving, so much so that we even have like a traditional Thanksgiving meal. And and if you noticed on social media, I saw some people would post, hey, here's our family, here's our table. And and there was often one thing that was shared. If, If it was just a traditional Thanksgiving meal, nobody normally said anything. It's Thanksgiving, here's our family. But then there were other people who were like, no turkey here. You know, like they're identifying the fact that they did something other than the traditional Thanksgiving meal, which is totally cool. But we even talk about it because it's so assumed, well, Thanksgiving means turkey and stuffing and cranberry sauce and mashed potatoes, and if you don't do that, you're weird, right? Like, that's just kind of the assumption that we have. But around that table at Thanksgiving, there's, there's joy, right? There, there's a sense of belonging. There's, there's a warmth. Laughter can be heard. Stories are told and retold, right? I mean, some of us, if we're honest, we're like, yeah, every year, my dad, my mom, tell that same story. And you're like, it's great, but I've heard it 82 times, right? You're like, it's, it's time to move on. They need a different story to tell, right? There's stories that are part of it, and there's laughter. But there's oftentimes a collective grieving, too, because we know with each passing year, there's the potential that there's a seat around the table that's now empty that was one time filled. It's never easy 
years and years later, even still thinking about what Thanksgiving or whatever holiday it is, what it was like when that person was present. Well, today we're talking about a table from 2,000 years ago, a table that was set for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, a table to remember the Passover. 2,000 years ago, reflecting on something that happened 1,500 years before that. If you're not good at math, that's 3,500 years from now. And it was God's promise and provision to one day send a Redeemer. Now, in Luke chapter 22, we have another table that's probably the most famous table in human history. And it's why we're coming to a close today in this series, Dinner with Jesus, because it's a central part of the sacrament that we practice that we'll share in here as we close today. But it's also one of the most significant contributions in human history when it comes to art. How many have seen this before, this next picture, Da Vinci's The Last Supper? Right? I mean, a very, very familiar painting. One of the most significant ever contributed by human hands. Now, have you ever stopped to analyze this painting? Just leave it up there for a minute. I know it's kind of hard in this room. For those of you joining us online, it's probably easier to see. But there's a lot, of, a lot of subtle clues in this masterpiece that communicates the story of what happened that night. Of course, the first thing you see is Jesus is at the center. He's at the middle of it. From there, you can kind of see, okay, there are 12 disciples around him, but they're all broken up into groups of three, three, six, nine, 12, six on either side of Jesus. And, and they're all kind of, they're, they're in, in the midst of conversation. Jesus isn't necessarily speaking. He's quiet, and they're talking, and there's some gestures that they're making, almost like they don't quite grasp what he's talking about which was a common thing if you've read the Gospels. They don't really know what Jesus is saying. They don't really understand kind of the gravitas of what he means. And even on this night when he talks about his life being offered up, his body being broken, his blood being poured out, they're like, what does that even mean? Like we just came into Jerusalem like you're a superhero and now you're going to die? You're talking about that again? Like they're kind of confused. When you look a little closer on the left, there's a guy in blue that's Peter. And you may not be able to see it, but, but behind his back he has a knife in his hand as a symbol of his coming denial. Right in front of him, he's actually communicating with Judas. Judas is in the blue with, with a white t-shirt underneath, basically. And, um, and he has got his right hand around a bag of money as a sign of his betrayal. And what might be the most fascinating thing about this painting is that apparently in da Vinci's mind, he imagined that all of them were sitting on just one side of the table posing for a picture, right? It's kind of always been like, that's probably not what it looked like, right? Uh, especially in light of where we started with this series, where we often talk about how at the table they would recline, right? They would lay down on their stomach. Now, today a couple billion people across the planet are going to gather to worship Jesus. And in our minds, we sing, we pray, we, we hear sermons, we worship. Um, <coughs> and the focus is all about who Jesus is and what Jesus has accomplished. And the whole ministry and sacrifice of Christ is summed up by what happened that night at Passover in the upper room around that table. Millions of Christians and churches across the world today at some point will enter into the sacrament of communion. That Jesus encouraged us to remember his sacrifice every time we partook of, of communion. So let's go to Luke chapter 22, start in verse 14. To pick up the story that Luke tells. And when the hour came, Jesus reclined at table and the apostles with him. Now we have a better image of what that is going back to the first Sunday of this series. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again, not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he said, take this. And divide it among yourselves, for I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, which he had given thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Now at this, if you're there on that one side of the table, according to da Vinci's vision, you're leaning over each other looking at Jesus, right? <laughs> Listening to him, and you're, you hear all this about his body broken, his blood poured out, this sacrifice, he's going to suffer, and all of this, and what does that even mean? And then he says, and one of you here is going to betray me. Now immediately this sparks their imagination, this is a topic they want to talk about. Well, who's it going to be? 
who's going to betray you? You mean one of the long-term insiders here in the upper room is going to betray you? I mean, we, we expected it from outside, like trying to get us, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Jews. But we expected it to come in that. We expected maybe the Romans, or they, they'd put a spy in, in the circles that they were listening and watching. But, but the inner circle, somebody around this table is going to betray you? Verse 23, and they began to question one another, which of them it could be who is going to do this? Hey, who, who do you think it's going to be? Timothy, who, who do you think it's going to be? I don't know. Andrew, who, who's it going to be? Who, who's the one that has an agenda? Who's the one you don't trust? I mean, can you see how fascinating a provocative topic like this would be to very easily drift into hypotheses, drift into accusations and casting judgment towards one another of these 12 disciples? Verse 24 says, a dispute also arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest, the greatest. Now, now let me say something here. This verse where the disciples start to kind of point fingers, do you think it's him? Do you think it's him? Who could it be? I don't know. I've never trusted him. Yeah, you ever notice he's kind of always in the fringe? Like he always disappears when there's work to be done? Yeah, I know. I don't, I don't, I don't trust the guy. One time I told him something and then he said it to somebody else and he said it differently. Really? Oh yeah, I knew I could never trust that guy, right? And then all of a sudden they start to compare themselves, size one another. So I think I'm better than him. I don't, it's not me. I know, I, oh man, remember that one time? Remember that one time? I mean, this is, the fact that these two verses are in the New Testament is to me a powerful sign of the divine origin of the Bible and its accuracy of events from 2,000 years ago. I mean, think about it. If a human being is editing history at this moment and they want people in the future to look back on this moment with like an ethereal glow, like, oh, right? This is a verse you're like, you know what, let's edit that out. Let's take that out. The, the disciples started to, to debate and argue and cast judgment on one another. Well, I think I'm the coolest. No, I'm definitely the coolest. I mean, have you seen my social media posts? I got a lot more comments than yours. Well, I'm the most disciplined. No, you just like to get up in the morning. I like to sleep in. That doesn't mean you're the most disciplined. I mean, this is kind of like the yearbook in high school, like most likely to succeed disciple, right? And if you're looking at this from a historical context, if you want society to think that the leaders of your organization are near perfect and noble, you would be tempted to say, hey, Luke, those two verses, let's just kind of, let's kind of erase those. We don't necessarily need to add those. Because if people know that right after Jesus introduced communion, one of the two sacraments of the church, right after he told them about his death, that he's going to be arrested that night, he's going to give his life, they get into this immature argument about which of the 12 would betray Jesus and which of them is the best of them. I mean, if people understand the disciples are competitive like that and they're comparing themselves to one another and they're kind of demeaning some of them in their circle, that might cause people to say, well, I don't want to follow them. I don't want to go in that direction. I mean, that's just, that's not attractive at all. They might even doubt that they should be a part of leadership at all. But the fact that God chose to include these two verses shows us that it's not a human being that's editing the Bible. The Holy Spirit is editing the Bible. And the Spirit of God wants Luke to capture that these disciples are flawed human beings that easily get distracted just like you and just like me. That there's nothing unique or special about them that sets them apart as that, ah, right, ethereal glow. It means whatever God did with them is something God can do with you. For 1,500 years, the whole nation of Israel, Passover, they've been collectively asking God to send the rescuer, the redeemer. And on that night, he's seated at the Passover table with the 12. And all they can focus on at the table is who's gotten the most press in the towns they've traveled to, who's the one that Jesus has applauded the most, and who's the one Jesus has criticized the most. Today, we live in a culture where we're constantly, subconsciously even, Sometimes it's conscious, other times it's subconscious, where we're measuring ourselves against other people. People you work with, you know, people in your family, other kids' parents. You ever done that? It's like, well, why is their kid exceeding in sports, excelling in sports, and mine aren't? I'm a lousy parent. The house you live in, the car you drive, how much money you make, where you go on vacation. We so easily fall into a trap of attempting to measure or increase our greatest. So, so let me ask this question. What is it that makes you greater? 
I mean, we have a cultural ethic. It's kind of weighing over us that it's these, these tangible external things, how we look, people's opinion of us, what we've accomplished, what the bank account looks like, what our pension is, where we go on vacation. We have all these things, and we think, this is what makes my, me greater in people's eyes. This is what makes me more valuable. 2,000 years ago, this is what the, the same question the disciples are asking in the upper room. 2,000 years have passed, and we're still battling the same internal struggle that these guys did. And they're seated with the greatest human being that ever lived. And they're arguing over who they think is the greatest. This is pretty ironic, right? But why are they arguing over who's the greatest? How did they get there? And when you see the context, it's pretty easy to understand. They're arguing about greatness because that's the way you defend that you're not the one that will betray him. That's how you get there. If you start with somebody's going to betray me, you end up at a place trying to justify why you would never betray him. Well, it's not me. I left my boats and my nets and I followed him. Well, yeah, but well, it's not me. I left my family behind. I didn't have boats and nets, but I left everything else behind. And somebody else says, well, it's not me. I walked away from my lucrative tax collecting business. I could have owned 10 fishing teams and I left that all behind. I sacrificed more than all of you. Well, it wasn't me. I mean, I was there at the beginning when he turned water into wine. I was at the wedding. Well, I've been with him longer than you. Well, I joined just after you, so it's not me. Well, I was there when he raised the dead girl. You guys weren't there. Well, I was invited. I mean, me and my brother, we were invited up on the mountain to meet Moses and Elijah. It's definitely not us. Well, I was affirmed by Jesus when I said... Well, I was always right there beside him. You were always at the back of the line. I hung on every word. We couldn't even find you half the time. But he never asked you to do anything. He asked me to do everything. Well, he never called me Satan like he did Peter. Yeah, it's probably Peter. It's probably him, right? They're all defending why they would never betray Jesus by describing how great they are in comparison to each other. Meanwhile, the text almost gives us this impression that Jesus is still holding the cup of the new covenant in his hands while they're having this debate. I mean, the, the, the gift of the Eucharist, the table of grace, communion, it's so fresh and new. This is Jesus once again kind of elevating the Passover feast to something that, that is practiced continually in the future in the life of the church. And it's so fresh and real and, and transformational and it's all about Jesus saying, it's, it's not about me holding on to my life. It's about me sacrificing myself for others. And he's surrounded at the table by 12 guys that just keep talking about how great they are and building themselves up and even diminishing others to do it. You ever, have a, you ever think that maybe there was a moment where Jesus thought, I'm dying for these knuckleheads? Like, you think you ever had that moment? Next verse, Jesus looked at the disciples full of anger and rage in his eyes, filled with fire. Immediately the fire consumed the room and the disciples were burning and they're crying out, I was wrong, I'm sorry, I'm not the greatest. And Jesus replied, it's too late, your time is up, right? Now that's that's not how Jesus responds. Why? Because Jesus is an image of our Heavenly Father. He's patient and kind. As Paul says in Romans 2, 4, his kindness leads us to repentance. Because we know how he responds, we know who he is. It gives us a joy to confess our sins and repent and turn from them. And Jesus isn't surprised. This wasn't the first time that they debated who was the greatest among them. Luke records a few chapters earlier in chapter 9, probably somewhere about a year into Jesus' ministry when the disciples were following him. They're walking, and at this moment, Jesus catches them. And he, teach, he attempts to teach them something that apparently they forgot by the time we get to Luke 22 in the upper room, or they just never got it in the first place. And that's why Jesus has to circle back and circle back and circle back and circle back. And if you would say, well, yeah, there's things that I, I remember a moment where I said I took a step of obedience and I knew I should have taken it for years and I don't know why I never did, but now I did and it's amazing. The freedom it's brought my life. That's how we operate. God's just faithful to remind us over and over again of the things that maybe we've learned cognitively, but we haven't actually practiced. Talks about that in Philippians 2. We haven't put it into practice and experienced the fruit of it. Well, back in Luke chapter 9, Jesus catches them comparing one another to each other. 
And he uses this as an illustration. He uses a child. He says, he who is least among you all is the one who is great. He gives them a counter ethic to their culture. He says, in my kingdom, this is what makes you great. And he uses children who were often discarded, ignored. Most, you know, because of child mortality, most of them died anyways before they were very old. And so they were just kind of, when you get older, we'll give you a shot. But right now, you're kind of a nuisance. And Jesus welcomes children. He doesn't dismiss them. Jesus is saying in Luke 9, in his kingdom, greatness is not trying to figure out how you become number one or number two. That's what James and John were jockeying for. The greatest is actually the least. So you actually rise to become number one or number two by not trying to be. Right after Jesus delivers the sacrament of the body and the blood at the table at Passover, And he unveils to the disciples his deity and the sacrifice that's coming. Immediately after that, they get into an argument saying, I'm better than you. Oh, no, no, no. I I know I'm better than you. No, 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 no. No, I got you all beat. So they're arguing about their best efforts, seated at the table with, I mean, he's the goat, right? Greatest of all time. That's Jesus. They're arguing about who's the best with the best. And Jesus tries to teach them this lesson again, verse 25. And he said to them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. He's saying, this is worldly leadership you guys are arguing about. You get a position, you get to make the call, and then other people have to answer to you. And other people exist to serve you, to make your life great. And Jesus says, not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as one who serves For who is the greater, one who reclines at the table or one who serves? And they're reclining at the table when he says this, and people are probably serving them. It's not the one who reclines at the table. According to culture, it's not the one reclining at the table. I'm sorry, according to culture, he's he's saying it's the one reclining at the table, not the one serving. I'm among you then as the one who serves. He says, here I am, the greatest of all, the Son of God, the Messiah that's sent, and I'm serving you. I'm flipping this world upside down. My kingdom is an upside-down kingdom. You are those who have stayed with me in my trials. And I assign to you, as my Father assigned to me, a kingdom that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So what are the implications of this meal for our lives today, for our tables today? Who are the least that Jesus is talking about? Not because Jesus sees them as the least. It's because the world has identified them on the margin, on the fringe. And and at a cultural time where the Jews felt like the least. Well, the first implication of this is we have to make a choice. Do we commit to outserve the people I know? Do I commit to outserve the people I know? Your family starts there. If it's going to be authentic service, it has to start with the people closest to you, your family, your friends, your co-workers, and then your enemies and strangers. I don't know why, but just being honest with you, I have a tendency to go out of my way for a stranger, for someone I don't know very well. Sometimes, more often than I go out of my way for my own kids and my own wife. I don't feel like doing that right now. I'm tired. I have all the justifications. It's been a long week. It's been a busy season. I'll do that later. They don't need it done right now. And I don't know, maybe the urgency of the moment makes me say, well, I may never see this person again, and this opportunity may never be in front of me again, and so I want to be a blessing to them. But can you make that commitment to say, I want to outserve the people that I know? What would it look like if this was like the number one core value of the church of Jesus Christ in our culture? Would that change the world? I think it would change our culture and the way people see the church. And why do we do? Why would we outserve the people we know? Well, because that's what Jesus did for us. He was greater and he became least to serve us, to meet the need that we couldn't meet for ourselves. This is one of the reasons why we have done now, I think this is our seventh year of doing the Night to Shine prom in February. To love on a group of people that are precious to God. And if you're maybe fairly new in the life of the church family, you're like, I don't really know what, what is night to shine. It's a prom night experience that happens the Friday before Valentine's Day. And it's designed for people with special needs to just give them an incredible night where they're the central focus of celebration. 
to demonstrate that they're loved, to demonstrate that they matter, that, that God sees them, that God cares about them, that God created them, and they're a gift to our community. If you want to be a huge blessing as a part of a team, the planning has already started for Night to Shine. If you're like, you know what, I want to, I want to find out more about that, you can find the information on the app and when it is that they're meeting to gather. In addition to that, there's another thing coming up that our, our local FCA, Fellowship of Christian Athletes, is coordinating <clears throat> just a few weeks away. On Saturday, December 16th at 1 o'clock at the Middleburg School, there is an all-abilities basketball game that's happening. And it's being presented by FCA, and they're asking especially believers to fill the stands in the gymnasium and cheer on those people that are playing. Because there's a lot of people in our community that, that maybe were born with a special need, and they've never had anybody cheer for them. They don't know what that feels like. What a beautiful gift for a gymnasium to be filled with followers of Jesus that are just celebrating and encouraging them and cheering them on. You can go to nyfca.org to find out more about that. They're also doing some um, donations to be a fundraiser for FCA. Uh, and we support FCA here as a part of Fusion with some of our missions commitment. So commit to outserve the people that you know. And we do that first personally, but then we also have opportunities to do that as the church of Christ corporately. Ask the question, if you're going to commit to outserve the people that you know, start at home. How can I, how can I do that at home? What would be a blessing to the people in your home? How could you outserve your spouse? How could you outserve your kids? Kids, how could you outserve your parent? You'll blow their mind and you'll get the best Christmas you've ever had, I promise. <laughs> how can you outserve a neighbor in your community? How can you outserve a family member or a coworker that, if you're honest, you don't really want to serve at all. But see, God does this thing where he flips a switch in our heart and in our mind that transforms us, and it's not about what we want to do, it's we get to do. Yeah, but they don't deserve it. You don't know what they've done. Yeah, but you didn't deserve it either. And it's what God has done for you. I mean, how? flip it around. How would your life improve if the people closest to you outserved you? And what would it look like for you to make that one of your core values for the rest of your life? A second implication in, in this table is serve last first. We often call this the last supper, but I kind of called the title of the message today the last first supper. Because there's this principle that's tied to it. The fact that Jesus, that God would step out of eternity in the incarnation and step into the flesh of a human being and then sit at a table with broken, sinful people like tax collectors and other notorious sinners, like he would sit there with them and he would show them grace and mercy and love and compassion and generosity. I mean, th this is the Last Supper captured in that painting, but, but there's a principle embedded, not only lived out in the reality of Jesus at the table, but even what Jesus teaches at the table, that in his kingdom, it's a last first focus. And this applies in your family. It applies. It's a daily mindset that you choose to do the menial task, the dirty job. Whether you're at the top of the organization or at the bottom, whether, no matter what your title is, no matter how much money you have, no matter what people, what people are, are expected from you or, or of you, doesn't matter if you're the parent or the teenager, doesn't mean if you're the 11-year-old in your house, make a choice to say, I'm going to serve the last first do the dishes, clean the toilet, just put your socks away and keep quit leaving them on the floor. Start there. And even allow this to be a, a, a practical challenge to your family unit. Invite someone from the outside to your table, someone you maybe would never consider before. But because you're part of Jesus' family, you just want to create as many open doors to people's lives as possible for God to use. The Last Supper is a last first table. And Jesus invites the least and last to be on the inside. And then a third one. Don't try to be like a great person. Try to be like Jesus. And before we dismiss that, well, that's impossible. I can't be like Jesus. Well, hold on. Because there's something Paul actually says to the church in Philippi that makes this practical and actually sets us up as the bride of Christ, that this is an expectation now of what it means to walk in maturity in our faith. 
In fact, we're going to transition to communion. I'm going to invite the band back up to close us with a song as we receive communion. But I want to ask you, would you stand with me? I'm just going to read from Philippians chapter 2. And it's not on the screen because sometimes we can get distracted with that. I want you to just maybe even just want to stand and allow this to be maybe a prayer. But I want you to hold on to the words. And I want you to hear this assigned as kind of a a mission if you're a follower of Jesus. Paul's writing this to a church he knew well. He says this, Make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must, not you could, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue declare, Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you, and now that I'm away, it is even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation. Understand, Paul doesn't say work hard to earn your salvation. The work we do in obedience to God is to demonstrate our salvation's authentic, that our heart's being changed, and the evidence of my life is the fruit of that. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. In case you fell asleep there, let me say it again. Do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Hold firmly to the word of life. Then on the day of Christ's return, I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain and that my work was not useless. But I will rejoice even if I lose my life, pouring it out like a liquid offering to God, just like your faithful service is an offering to God. And I want all of you to share that joy. Would you just bow your head and close your eyes for a moment? And maybe there was something in there right now you're feeling conviction for. And you just need to confess it to God before you come forward to receive the body and the blood. You should say, Lord, I need to confess I've been incredibly selfish. I need to confess that I've been critical and I've complained. That I have not reflected you well. That maybe you would stand here today and, and you would just be honest before God and say, God, I am one of those perverse people in this society and yet I claim to know you because I keep choosing my flesh and not yielding to you, my king. Maybe you would confess and say, Lord, I'm not living an upside down kingdom life, but I'm really just trying to live like the rest of the world. I'm trying to kind of keep straddle this fence between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of earth and and I kind of want a a comfortable life, but I also want to know that I get to go to heaven when I die. And in this moment, Jesus is saying, don't be lukewarm. Be an extreme hot or cold. Like, like, be something significant. Don't just coast. Either trust me. And you can walk on water or just get out of the boat. Quit faking it. Pick up your cross. Carry me. Follow me where I lead. In this moment, just confess that sin. Say, God, I know I've fallen short be something incredibly specific that maybe happened this morning or in the car on the way here something last night this weekend maybe it happened around the Thanksgiving table and you're like I wish I could go back and do that differently 
Maybe it's an attitude you've been carrying. And, and right at the, the, near the beginning of this text, he said, have the same attitude. You must have the same attitude as Christ Jesus. Who wasn't focused on his position as son of God, but he took the nature of a servant. Maybe you look at your own life, you're like, you know what? There's not many, there's not many moments where I place myself under people. I like to be over people. I like to be in charge. Maybe you would say, you know what? I don't feel like I've ever been in charge and that's what I want. I want to be in charge. I think I'm more trustworthy than other people. Jesus says, don't seek number one or number two. Serve. Just serve. And leave that up to God. Trust Him. Lord Jesus, we come before you as a people that are broken and flawed. We're still in process as we follow you. We are so grateful to have this table that we can come to. The table that that represents the transformation of all our lives. The symbol of the body of Christ broken for us and his blood poured out. And God, there is nothing we have more gratitude for in our entire lives than the sacrifice of your son on the cross in our place. And our savior, our brother, our friend, our redeemer, through salvation, the gift of your spirit now living inside of us so that we can be like Jesus. And the greatness of Christ can shine through our lives, that we would shine like bright lights in a dark and perverse world. So would you bless this time, Father? Would you bless these elements as we come forward together as your bride? We take the bread and we dip it into the juice, remembering that your body was broken, that it was drenched in your blood, and that your blood is the new covenant. It accomplishes what we could never accomplish for ourselves. In your mighty and holy name, we thank you, God, for that. And all God's people agreed together and said, amen. The worship team is going to lead us through a song on gratitude. At any point you would like to, feel free to come forward receive communion and you can hold on to it you can rec- you can kneel down at the kneelers for those of you joining us online you can just find anything you have in the house a bread and water or a cracker and some orange juice it doesn't matter it's a symbol of the body and blood of Christ and there's there's power in the eating and remembering what he's done for us words fall short I got nothing new How could I express All my gratitude I could sing these songs As I often do But every song must be Set for hearts 
Good morning. How's everybody doing today? Good. My name is Corey, and I'm the, I almost said home pastor. That used to be what I did, but home, youth, what's the next thing I'm going to do? Um, I'm the Connections Pastor here at Fusion. It is so awesome to get to see all you here, both in person and online. If you are here in person, this is Tracy. We call each other our partners. We're, we're our partners in crime. We're, uh, we're uh, out there at guest services together, but she kind of greets and hangs out with the people that are in person. Yes, good morning. Um, We're so honored to have you here today. And um, 
I, I'm trying to make this position my own, but um, I just want to let you know that um, the fact that you chose to be with us today, to spend your morning with us, and all the things you could have done today, you came to spend your morning with us. Um, we're very grateful for that. So thank you. Thank you for that. And I want to meet you personally. So if you would fill this card out and bring this to me out at guest services. If you're new. If you're new. If you're sorry. New. If you're new. <laughs> The rest of you are out. <laughs> you get nothing. <laughs> she doesn't want to talk to you. No, <laughs> no. Could come the ushers come, come forward too as we're as we're and, interacting? Uh, here? I just want to give you a, a little gift from us. Sorry. I'm <laughs> no, trying it's, to be... <laughs> no, it's all good. That room. <laughs> I do it all the time. Ask them. Uh, <laughs> not that funny, Adele. Uh, <laughs> what was I going to say now? See? <laughs> uh, if you're online with us, we also welcome you. It is so awesome, like Tracy said, that you took time out of your day. Maybe you're in your pajamas, you're drinking your cup of coffee that you had to make. You couldn't come here and get a cup of coffee. Uh, but it's just so awesome that you get, uh, take, took some time to spend with us uh, here this morning. If you're a first-time guest and you're online, we also ask you to check in on our app. And there's a button that says, I'm new. I have a gift that I would love to email you here this week. Uh, I can't do that if you don't check in. Um, so that's really important to us. You can share prayer requests. You can share next steps. Uh, check out that app. There's tons of different things happening uh, there. So uh, I just want to invite you to do that. But hey, we're going to pray over the offering, and then we're going to show a video that happens. Uh, and then the band is going to lead us out. One thing I do want to mention before we pray is if something, uh, if you're going through something, this week and you really need prayer or you need somebody to talk to, uh, there is a group of people over here on the on my right, your left, uh, that would love to just spend some time with you and pray. You don't have to share anything. Uh, you don't have to say a word. You can just walk up to them and they'll just start praying for you. Uh, so I just want to make that available to anybody in person. Uh, please, um, they would love to meet you and love to pray over you uh, here today if you feel led. You're off. It's deceiving because I'm unmuted in my ears, so I'd never know if I'm in the house. I just wanted before before we like pray and then go into a song. If you are digging what's going on on the stage today for our Christmas setup, I just want to shout out Dave DeGeorge, Steve Anderson, uh, Colleen Badger, um, Bill Haley. and Bill Haley for just a lot of hard work and help with getting this set up. So if you like what's going on, give them a, a huge thank you today if you see them. Okay, so we're going to pray and then watch that video. God, thank you for the opportunity we have to be here. Um, we're just so thankful, as Tracy said, that we as a church family can come here and spend the morning together um, worshiping you. Um, but God, we know that your Holy Spirit isn't in this, just in this building, but it travels with us. And so God, I pray that as we give, as we leave here today, we would remember this week um, that you're with us every step of the way. Um, and we also have the opportunity to share that with people who may not know you, um, you, you may be, they, who may be struggling this week, um, and we can come across them and, um, and introduce, you to, introduce you to them. So I pray that you would just impress upon us that. Uh, be with us as we give, knowing that what we give will further your kingdom for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Take a look at this video. enlightened hearts that can somehow see him and sense him at work. I want to know he's at work. I want to sense his presence. I want to see Jesus in people. I want to stand in somebody's presence and think Jesus is all over her. This is the communication of God Almighty to mankind and that we are to live by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. The abundant life is not when there are no impossible situations and you're experiencing peace and joy and happiness. That's all nice. But what abundance really means is when you're in the impossible situation and right in the heart of your impossible, you say, now is the time for me to see and experience the fullness of God. Jesus took his disciples and he opened up their understanding to the scriptures. You can know so much more than you do, so can I. He can open our minds and our hearts to the scriptures. Do you want to go deeper still? Do you want to go deeper still? Hear the 
angel song that rings so sweet and clear when heaven's beauty fell and mercy found us here the glory in the highest and on the earth begins the glory to God the angels sing His goodness and His grace To show the brightness of His smile The glory of His face The glory in the highest And on the earth beneath The glory to God your children see His name shall be called one Everlasting fire.